live uh, in the in the center. Uh, but uh, but we only will go uh, for conducting some test. We will go to the uh, the area of the launch tower. Professor, I believe an old friend of ours is also joining us on the line here through Skype, Mr. Xian Song, who is our uh, veteran guest here on our special coverage here. Mr. Xu, if you can hear me, we we're just talking about how exciting it is to see the motorcade make its way to the launch tower. What is going on? What is uh, on your mind right now, Mr. Xu? Well, I think the astronauts are ready to uh, uh, ascend to the tower. Uh, but uh, these, are, of course, uh, will take a 10-minute uh, journey of uh, farewells. And then they will, uh, they will be uh, assisted by the, uh, uh, the, what would they call the launching assistants. Uh, the staff will take them all the way to the top of the rocket, where they will uh, be uh, slide in with the, with the flight. Uh, uh, as every time did. Uh, as uh, Professor Young also mentioned, one veteran, two uh, newcomers. But uh, don't, mention, don't forget that there are three more astronauts that are in the Tiangong already. So they will be joining, join, joining them uh, with six crews. I think this will be also a, a six to seven hour quick uh, rendezvous and docking. So mm. they are expected to be arriving very soon to the station. Mm. What a historic moment when that happens, you know, uh, six crew members handover inside the China Space Station. What will you be looking out for when that happens, Professor Yang? Uh, well, honestly speaking, uh, for other countries, it happened uh, in 1980s. You know that during the operation of the Mir Space Station, uh, just the uh, in-orbit orbital uh, handover were achieved by the uh, Soyuz uh, uh, crewed spacecraft. You know, this is, this is really necessary. As we've already discussed, you know, we, uh, we are conducting so many very complicated scientific research experiments in outer space. And you know, that's, uh, mm, uh, in fact, many of the research cannot be finished by a single crew. Mm. So you know that the handover of these tasks will be a very uh, inevitable uh, task. But you know that. Uh, what will they be doing together when the two crews meet? You mean, I was thinking that it's just going to be a very brief hand handover between five to ten days, depending on what they yes. need to do. But then you mentioned it is critical that they join hands together to perform certain tasks. For what instance, if you are conducting a, a scientific research on the microgravity physics, maybe you've already done a lot of preparation works to uh, test the facility, test the scientific research lab, but probably you can have not finished it. Then uh, for the next crew, you may tell him what the progress you are mm. and uh, where is the necessary uh, devices, where is the necessary accessories. So mm. this is a very important task for them. And also what problem he has already met and how to, what is his consideration of how to handle this problem. So with the face-to-face -face communication is the most efficient way and very necessary Absolutely. way. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Uh, Mr. Xu, can you also tell me your expectations for that handover inside the China Space Station? I mean, what will they be doing together? It's not just going to be a meet and greet, right? Well, I think once they're docked, they will have to be uh, a hatch opening ceremony and people will float over to hug and, uh, and greet each other. And also, I think the, the, the new crew probably brought some new uh, fresh fruits to the to the uh, six months already uh, stationed <laughs> astronauts. Uh, so they are expected to be very excited. I think more people in orbit would be uh, more communications. And the three people cooped up there for six months is uh, probably had enough of each other. Well, I can only imagine the minute that hatch opens and they see each other face to face, it's gonna be a very exciting and happy moment there. As we continue to monitor the actions in Jiuquan and the motorcade, um, escorting the three Taikonauts continues to make its way to the launch site. And you know that, uh, as we've already mentioned, the space station is a very complex and a very huge system. We have a regenerated life support system. Mm. But for this setup, you know that the more uh, complicated it is, the more possible it will have some malfunction during the ten, more than 10 years of operation. Mm. So, you know, that's, uh, it is a very normal, it is a natural uh, phenomenon. Uh, but you see, uh, to keep the normal operation or uh, keep the security, safety of our astronauts, the, the astronauts on board will must uh, be aware of where, uh, what the status is and where they have some problems. So, 
to telling the next crew uh, these kind of uh, things will be, you know, that quite critical mm. uh, for, for their uh, safety uh, for the next crew. So this is also another reason we must uh, uh, conducting this in orbit handover. Mm. Passing down their experience, the lessons they've learned. Not only the experience. You see, for, for instance, maybe you have a bottle of medicine mm. and you have already put it there and it is also needed for the next crew. Mm. So you must tell him or her. Mm. Yes, that's a critical part of their job and this handover will happen with future crews also. It will be a tradition carried on from the Shenzhou 15 mission. Obviously, when they welcome their next mission, the Shenzhou 16, they will have their own handover as well. They will be passing down valuable lessons and experience from their six month stay in the China Space Station. So the plan is we will continue to have uh, this rotation of crews every six months. So from this point on, it will be um, you know, six month long crew stays inside the China Space Station. Well, quite right. You know, that's, uh, uh, we've already mentioned that the Shenzhou 14 crew is the most, uh, is the busiest crew. Mm. Uh, but one of their major tasks is unpacking. Mm. Uh, not only the packages in the Tianzhou 5 cargo spacecraft, but also the uh, packages in the Wentian and the Mengtian module. So the unpacking is a really tough task for all of them. And also, ab absolutely, they cannot accomplish all these unpacking uh, tasks. So uh, which part, which uh, uh, package has already been opened and where it is, they must tell this to mm. the Shenzhou 15 crew. Really necessary. They don't have enough time to, to finish all the unpacking? That is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. You see that, uh, you know, that's uh, for the scientific research racks. Uh, usually, uh, uh, when it reaches into, into the orbit, it is, the fine, it is not the final status. Because you know that during the launch, during the launch of the Long March 5B, the racks must experience the intensive vibration and also the G-forces. So usually, the, uh, uh, the structure of the uh, scientific research racks is enhanced and something is fixed. So uh, during uh, when they reach the orbit and uh, when the Shenzhou 14 crew entered these uh, modules, they must uh, uh, re reinstall these scientific research racks. Oh, and also, some of the parts, especially some spare parts, are in the packages brought by the, either by the Tianzhou 5 cargo spacecraft or by the module itself. So these are uh, a lot of work they must do. Uh, Mr. Xu, let me bring you uh, in here. Before they get completely tired of each other, I mean, with the Shenzhou 14 crew members, they certainly have done a lot of work um, on a very busy and tight schedule, as Professor uh, Yang was talking about. Three spacewalks to begin with, space lectures, yes. and also scientific experiments as usual. Mr. Xu, I want to get your assessment, your take on the work of the Shenzhou 14 crew. How did they do? in your opinion? Well, Shenzhou 14 built the station itself. I mean, the, uh, the core module was launched and uh, it was handed over to Shenzhou 14 crew. And also uh, the, the Wentian and Mengtian was launched also in this duration. And the uh, connections and rendezvous and dockings, uh, commissioning, uh, three EVAs and education and training courses, unpacking, a lot of things. I think this has been the busiest crew so far. Uh, not only uh, longer durations, but also uh, the number of tasks they have been in their hands, and also the expectation of the Shenzhou 15, which is also a, uh, a rendezvous and gathering of six crews, and also they will have also have to have a handover of many things, uh, scientific missions, uh, logbooks, and, and uh, the station status and everything. So they have they have been this so far the busiest crew so far, and also mm. we have the uh, Liu Yang, who is also the first astronaut and their, their second flight to the station. Mm. And also, uh, the uh, Fei Junong has also been the, uh, the, uh, the number two uh, astronauts who flew on Shenzhou 6. Mm. So all of these veterans are be also be gathering. So uh, I think Shenzhou, 15, uh, Shenzhou 14 has been uh, very busy. Yeah, I'm sure when they heard from the ground, uh, their ground colleagues that Shenzhou 15 colleagues are bringing them gifts. They're like, well, well-deserved, you know, and given how um, tirelessly we've worked on this mission, you better bring us some gifts. And we are very curious about what those gifts are. We should find out together. 
and it looks like the motorcade is pulling in to the launch site there. It's a short drive from Wenqianggea, where that send-off ceremony was held just moments ago. Look how beautiful that is. The launch tower is standing um, in a very cold night, uh, nevertheless. Um, Mr. Shi, can I also briefly ask you about the weather conditions? I mean, low temperature was not ideal, but Professor Yang said it's not going to be a huge problem. What are some of the challenges posed by uh, low temperatures in terms of the launch itself? Well, I think the, uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is the uh, safety of the rocket itself, uh, the fueling and the uh, unlocking of the whole rocket, including all the connections, uh, all the pipes. So the low temperature pose uh, some threat to the operation, and in particular, the pers uh, personnel that is around the rocket. But the rocket is built for, uh, for rigid uh, uh, conditions because uh, the, the rocket has to go through the atmosphere and also go to outer space. Hmm. So the rocket it, uh, itself uh, should be very solid. Uh, but the uh, preparation may be a, a little bit challenged for the, for the crew itself hmm. uh, and also for the, uh, for the people who is around the rocket. It's a solid uh, carrier rocket and also time-tested rocket in terms of sending manned missions. The Long March 2F carrier rocket has been consistently used with China's manned missions. Professor Yang, can you talk to us about this carrier rocket and how solid it is, how um, trusted it is for missions like this? Uh, well, you know, that's the, the rudiment of the Long March 2F is Long March 2E. Uh, it is the uh, first launch vehicle in China which have uh, strap-on uh, boosters. The astronauts um, have arrived at the launch site. Exactly. They've already uh, reached the launch complex. Mm. So they will use the elevator to reach the ninth floor. The ninth floor. That's always the floor. Yeah. Uh, because you know that the hatch on the side of the uh, payload fairing is at the ninth floor. Mm. They will be taken to the ninth floor. I understand they will be um, escorts helping them through this process? Exactly. Uh, actually speaking, as Yan Song has already mentioned, uh, they will be uh, taken good care by the, uh, the crew of the uh, astronaut system. Uh, for instance, uh, some of them are monitoring their uh, house sitters uh, and, and some of them will support them to assist them to go inside, go inside the, uh, the cabin. Mm. You, you, you can see that the elevator is moving. Mm. And you know that's uh, you may notice uh, with this launch complex, we can with the rotational uh, platforms, we can form a closed envelope for the uh, combination of the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. So this can keep the temperature uh, to mm. a comfortable level. Mm. Well, we do want to also check in with our reporter Zheng Yibing, who is near the launch site, as we bring you those light pictures from the launch complex there. Yibing, good evening to you. We see the Taikonauts have now arrived at the launch site. They're being carried um, in that lift, the ninth floor, getting ready to enter the cabins. What do you have for us, Yibing? Well, now after the ceremony to start a space expedition of the three Chinese Taikonauts of the Shenzhou 15 mission, they have just arrived at the launch area here at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. Usually, there will be another brief greeting by the leaders of the launch site at the uh, launch pad over there, just uh, 1.5 kilometers away from here. The Taikonauts would get up to the top level of the launch pad. This is a launch pad for over 100 meters. The main structure is about 75 meters, and the Long March 5 carrier rocket is really long, is really tall. And a flight combination of the Shenzhou 15 manned spacecraft and the Long March 2 F carrier rocket is standing there. For more on the situation here, we have invited a guest from the launch system. Join us now is Mr. Chen Muye, the designer of the overall system of the Long March 2 F carrier rocket from China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. Good to see you. Uh, Chen Lao you Hi, 
us today. We know the A combination that yesterday finished OD a fueling wave. Right now, we know about that flight combination that has the status right now. Um, right now, everything is in good condition, and we finished all the checkings, and all the indicators showed that right now in a good performance and ready to launch. And in June, I also participated in the launch of Shenzhou 14. I know this right after, look at this, this is the backup for June mission. Anything change after that? For this carry rocket, actually, it's a new one. So if you compare it to the uh, Y-14 uh, carry rocket, you could see here, actually, we have made 45 improvements. So a lot of the indicators are actually much stronger and reliable. And we also noticed uh, one thing at uh, this time. The launch is the latest one. And also in the uh, lowest temperature, right now the temperature is minus 16 degrees Celsius. And it's approaching to the midnight that will be below 20 degrees Celsius. So for this really cold temperature, what preparation have done to the carry rocket? Yes, indeed, it's really freezing here and also a big challenge to the carry rocket. So to cope with this uh, temperature, we have also made a lot of preparation. First of all, you look at uh, this closed um, environment, we have the uh, air conditioning to send the uh, air to the whole situation to the complex and also add the a heating the a film so um, this time we'll also make sure that the a last arm will be at a later time to open so make sure that everything is uh, very smooth and in orderly manner so for this kind of the low temperature we can see that a lot of time that we will see some the a falling pieces actually it's not the a debris that's the a protection film Yes, indeed, that's for us to make sure that the modules meet the uh, launching requirements, make sure that the combination uh, in good condition. So we talk about that to really give a lot of that the heating, that the heat, or you can consider as a down jacket to protect and keep it warm. The chief designer from the overall planning system of the Long March 2 F carrier rocket from China, Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. At the moment, we are coming down to the final moment of the launch moment, the ignition moment of the, uh, the uh, Shenzhou 15 uh, by combination with the, on top of the Long March 2F carry rocket. We're expecting that moment to come. Back to you. Yiving, we are monitoring uh, with you and it's reassuring to know that all indicators show that things are moving smoothly. CD Tianbo Porter Zheng Yiving near the launch site in Jiuquan. Let's also get our viewers caught up with what's been happening in the last few moments. The Taikonauts are being now seated after um, they've been carried to the ninth floor of the launch pad. Um, with the help of personnel from the astronaut system, they are getting ready before they enter the capsules. Now the um, personnel are taking their boots off, which is a crucial critical because they can't obviously wear their um, yes. boots inside the capsule. Um, what are they waiting for now, Professor Yang? So you can see uh, three astronauts uh, sit on the seats, and the uh, the crew of uh, the the staff of the astronauts them are helping them to handle uh, or changing the status of the IEA spacesuit or the intravehicular uh, activity spacesuit. So this suit is only used for them, uh, uh, very different from the EVA spacesuit. But this is also. Uh, greatly uh, important measure to ensure the safety of our astronauts. Uh, you know that the, uh, you know that the outer space is in a vacuum condition uh, and the carbon or the re-entry uh, capsule they leave there is a pressurized chamber. But you know that this is still not still safe enough for our astronauts. So if anything wrong happened to the pressurized chamber of the re-entry capsule, we still have another protection, the IVA spacesuit. So to checking the IVA spacesuit is very, very important task just before the launch. Moreover, you see that the although it is only used inside the cabin, 
but it is also very uh, complex. Not, although it is not so complex like the EVA spacesuit, but still, you know, that we have the uh, multiple layers of its clothes, and also uh, we have the ventilation system uh, mm. in, inside the cabin, uh, and also the oxygen supply, uh, and the removal of the carbon dioxide. So you see that uh, you may notice that just uh, several years before, before uh, during the early manned missions of China, uh, usually the, uh, the, the astronauts will grasp a small box. So that box is used for the ventilation uh, during, uh, when they are not inside the cabin. Uh, you know that uh, when they go inside the Shenzhou uh, spaceship, uh, they will connect the uh, IV spacesuit with the cabin, uh, with the power supply, with the oxygen supply, and ventilation. We can hear this voice is a simulation, uh, just the last uh, uh, simulation of the whole system. Mm. And, and Mr. Xu, uh, I'm sure you're getting these live pictures as well. The Taikonauts are being seated. They are waiting to enter the capsule. They do seem cool, calm, collected. They've been training for this moment, not just for years. Some of them for decades. Two of them belong to China's first generation of trained astronauts. The other. Uh, belonging to the second generation, and now this is their moment. Um, it will be some time before the liftoff. Talk to us, Mr. Uh, Xu, about what to expect in this window before they enter the capsule and the liftoff of the rocket. Two hours, 15 minutes from uh, liftoff. Uh, the astronauts arrive at the tower. They're being dressed up uh, to their suits. Uh, remember, uh, and also on the uh, right-hand side, you can see three cameras uh, facing the service module and also the capsule inside. So they will be slid into the capsule. Remember, there's a uh, one key element of the whole uh, campaign and also whole launching. Uh, any simulation cannot be done, which is the safety sector. Uh, the astronaut has to be uh, uh, has to have a backup plan at all times. Uh, for example, at the tower, they have a, a, a sliding tube all the way to the bunker. Uh, if there's a, a case of the rocket and the capsule, they can quickly go to the uh, slide, uh, slide tube, and uh, inside the slide tube is a piece of rubber, so that can, they can also have frictions, so they don't have to slide very fast. And also inside the capsule, they have escape pod. This is how they mentioned about this, uh, uh, this uh, height of the rocket, 58.3 uh, meters. That includes uh, almost 10 meter long uh, leap escape tower. So that escape tower can have, uh, even you have zero velocity, you can still take off uh, the capsule and uh, land the capsule in safe zones. And the third stage, of course, is the uh, once you drop the uh, the caps, uh, the escape tower, you're in outer space. We had an accident uh, a couple of years ago by a, a Russian and American who was flying the Soyuz, and they had a problem at the altitude of 110 kilometers. So, but they came back safely because they have the, the tower, the capsule itself can have a re-entry, uh, also keep the astronauts safe. So all the security and safety measures are very important for the whole launching campaign. You simply cannot be too careful with these situations because um, you know, anything can go wrong, theoretically. Uh, Mr. Xu, we do thank you for your time and your analysis. As always, we hope to talk to you soon on our special program here. Uh, Professor Yang, let, let's do talk about contingency plans and plan Bs because they are so important in ensuring the safety and security of the Taikonauts here. Mr. Xu, uh, Xu was talking about uh, the escape tower. Of course, th these plans all depend on what stage you are in um, during the liftoff, and they can vary from stage to stage. There is the escape tower. Um, and what else do we know to ensure the safety of the Taikonauts? Not only the safety of the astronauts must be ensured, but also the ground staff. Absolutely. You know that the, uh, at this moment, the launch vehicle has already been fueled. The, uh, the fueling position has already been completed. You know, there are more than 400 tons of propellants inside the rocket. And also, there are uh, propellants inside the uh, Shenzhou spaceship. Uh, you know that the software to detecting the failures will be a very critical part for what you mentioned to ensure the safety. And you are very correct. It depends on which stage it is. So at this moment, the emergency is, uh, escape tower or the emergency escape system has not been uh, validated. You know that at this moment, you know the, the, the top floor of the rotational platform is still closed. 
So at this moment, we cannot use the uh, emergency escape power to uh, separate the central spaceship from the uh, the, the uh, carrier rocket. So only when the uh, uh, ground staff has already retreated, uh, the Shenzhou 14, uh, 15 crew has already entered, and the hatch has already been closed. Only at this moment, we can switch on the emergency escape system, which means that with the detection of multiple sensors, we can judge the condition and have an evaluation. And based on the result of the evaluation, uh, we can decide whether to ignite the emergency escape system or not. So uh, it's, uh, it's largely automatic, depending on the sensors, sensor data. Is that what you're saying? For the emergency system to kick in, it's largely automatic. It's you don't need manual operations once you detect anything for that to happen. Uh, it is uh, in most cases it is uh, in the automatic style. But you know that we are also have control panels inside our cabin, inside the rear end capsule, and the astronauts. You may notice that they have a three. Uh, they have uh, they have a panel with uh, buttons on uh, on it, and also they have a stick to control the uh, uh, control panel. Uh, so during the uh, whole process, uh, process, the astronauts can also judge the status, judge the situation uh, with reading the uh, data on the on the board. Uh, so they can also uh, do something uh, right with the right decision during the whole process. We should also emphasize that the emergency escape power is only a part of the whole emergency escape system. Mm. So uh, you know that uh, when it is uh, on, still on the launch complex and uh, during the initial phase of uh, ascending, we use the emergency escape tower uh, to separate the uh, Shenzhou spaceship from the uh, uh, carrier rocket. But when the attitude is uh, high enough, uh, we will jettison the emergency escape tower. But you know that at this moment, we still have other emergency escape engines, uh, mainly the rocket engines, on the payload fairing. So at this moment, we can still, if anything wrong happened to the launch vehicle, we can still separate the Shenzhou spaceship from the uh, launch vehicle itself. But after, you know, that's uh, at a certain uh, attitude, we will separate the payload fairing. Uh, but you know that uh, usually in the normal, normal case, at this moment, uh, the, uh, the first stage has already separated from mm. the, so only the second stage remained. At this moment, if we, anything wrong happened to the second stage, we can use the engine on the Shenzhou spaceship to separate the two spacecraft together. Mm. So that is the difference. Oh, you can see, uh, as Yenso has already mentioned, uh, on the left of the screen is the uh, profession of the three astronauts. Mm. Uh, so they are still, the, the ground staff are still helping them uh, to, uh, for the preparations. Mm. Well, on the right, you can see the cameras inside the Shenzhou spaceship. Mm. Uh, you can see in the that's middle. That, that's the return capsule, right? Uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the top is the re-entry capsule, I believe, in the middle is in the orbital module. Mm. You know that uh, we, uh, our Shenzhou spaceship adopted a three module design. Mm. So the astronauts will first uh, enter the Shenzhou spaceship to the orbital module mm. from its side hatch mm. because there is an interval between the side hatch and the payload fairing. And then they will go down to the re-entry capsule because you know that the commander, Mr. Fei Jinlong, mm. will sit in the middle. Mm. So he will be the last one entering the Shenzhou 15 spaceship. Right. right. And we see the Taikonauts keep talking to each other while they uh, wait to enter the capsule. It's a good thing that they are talking and, and it, it, you know, to keep things light, obviously. And what about all these um, tracking data that we keep hearing? I mean, the rocket is not even in the air yet. Why do we need all, the, all these tracking information from different locations? Well, along its downrange trajectory, we have multiple ground stations, and also we have the Tianlian data relay satellite. So the data, the critical data of the uh, representing the status of the uh, Shenzhou spacecraft and the launch vehicle will be sent to these ground stations and uh, also with uh, uh, to the Tianlian data relay satellite as well. 
You so with these all kinds of data, including the videos, we can judge the status of the uh, carrier rocket. So we can judge whether it, the flight is normal or not. So this is also a very, very important measure to ensure the safety of our astronauts. Mm. Okay, looks like um, the first Titanon is ready to enter the capsule. Can we make out who that is? Uh, usually it is uh, zero 02 or zero 03. Uh, must be Mr. Deng Qingming or Mr. Zhang Lu. He is waving goodbye before he uh, see enters. You, see, you next, uh, see you next year? The capsule. Next year, it's a six month stay yeah. aboard the China Space Station. They will return yes. in May 2023. Yes. Uh, so, this is a video uh, camera mounted in the orbital module. You orbital can see module. a ground stop help the astronauts go inside the and then go down mm. to the They will capsule. slide down to the return capsule where they will be seated. As Professor Yang mentioned, the commander will be seated in the middle. And this must be Mr. Deng Qingming or Mr. Zhang Lu. Mm. Have they practiced this before in their training? Um, uh, quite many times. Okay. And you know that just uh, uh, last week, uh, the Jiuqian Satellite Drone Center conducted a, a, a full stage uh, drill uh, of the whole system. Uh, so that is the last rehearsal of the whole system. Mm. Uh, this is also very important. When you say whole system, does it mean the absolute whole process, including entering the capsule, getting ready for liftoff? That whole the, la the launch site system, the rocket system, the Shenzhou space system, the astronaut system, the telemetry, telecontrol, okay, and the, the second telecontrol is, is, Go uh, inside. is going inside, is moving yeah. into position now. Just uh, as I mentioned, you can see there is, uh, there is a hole on the payload fairing, mm. and it is just uh, close to the side hatch of the orbital module. So they will go first uh, into the orbital module. Mm. And also you, uh, from this video, we can see the, with the help of the ground staff, uh, the second astronauts go inside. Mm. And you know, their helmet must be well protected mm. because you know that the, the hatch is very narrow mm. and also uh, it's a little bit dangerous. So it's the helmet must be protected. Mm. And with this help, and also you can see all kinds of packages. I believe the gifts will be here. The gifts will be wrapped and uh, hidden in the packages. Exactly. We're so that's, in the, that's located in this are. orbital module. Absolutely. So the commander will be the last one. Uh, to you know that uh, with the development of technology today, our Shenzhou spaceship uh, can upload several hundreds of cargo uh, inside this orbital oh, module. I mean, do they? Well, can they bring just about anything? Is there? Like, uh, does it have to be in a certain category? Do they just bring whatever they want? Not everything. They may, must consider about the safety of the whole procedure. So uh, some, some personal things, some private things, can, they, can, uh, they can get to, the, uh, to their cabin, but not all, everything. OK. All right, two of the uh, three Taikonauts have now entered the return capsule. This is where they will be. Um, both during liftoff and during their return trip back to Earth. Yes. You may notice their seat is like a basin, and this basin is shaped with a uh, with, uh, certain, certain size of the astronauts. Mm. It's specially designed and manufactured. Okay, so it's, uh, it's tailored made. It's Tailor made uh, to suit each astronaut. Yes, the commander will go inside. Zhu Jilong is the veteran on this crew. Yes. He um, was among China's first generation of trained astronauts. He was a, uh, a candidate for the first manned mission. He wasn't the first man to, uh, to be launched, but then he did make a flight back in 2005 with the Shenzhou 6 mission. Uh, and also, he is the commander of the Shenzhou 6 mission. That's right. And now after, what, 17 years, he is the commander-in-chief again on this particular mission, the Shenzhou 15. Um, what a milestone it must be for him. And um, a million things must be going on in his mind right now as he embarks on this new journey. He must be so proud because he gets to be um, on the final crew, uh, manned crew, uh, to witness the official completion of construction of China's own space station.
uh, you may notice that uh, he's just uh, signing in, in the paper. Mm. So, uh, which means that he must uh, confirm the status of the orbital module. Mm. So that is the also very important. Moreover, you see that during the Shenzhou 6 mission, Mr. Bei Jinlong is also the first one of China's astronauts go inside the, go entering the orbital module in orbit. Mm. You know that Mr. Yang Liwei, during the Shenzhou 5 mission, our first crewed mission, man manned mission, he only stay in the re-entry capsule, and he never go inside the orbital module during the flight, uh, because at that moment we have not prepared the final status of the orbital module, so he only stayed in the re-entry capsule. But during the Shenzhou 6 mission, it was the first time the Chinese astronauts go inside, go entering the orbital module uh, during the flight. So Mr. Fei Jinlong, uh, just uh, uh, last moment, he was in the orbital module, and he was also the first one of Chinese astronauts to entering the orbital module. Professor, it's such a pleasure to have you on. We'll keep talking about this process and witness some new history being made. Thank you so much. Three modules make up the China Space Station's basic T-shape, which was completed with the arrival of the Meng Tian Lab. Let's take a closer look at this basic configuration. Two days after Meng Tian arrived at the China Space Station, the Meng Tian module successfully completed its transposition to complete the basic T-shape configuration. The T-shape is formed by the original core module launched in April 2021 and the two lab modules launched on July and October this year. With the three modules, the space station is like a luxury three-room house for us in space. The Tianhe core module and the Wintian lab module each have three beds to accommodate a crew of up to six at a time. When I took part in the Shenzhou 9 mission 10 years ago, we only had one lab module, Tiangong 1. Now we have three. They are very large. We're happy and proud of our country. Please allow me to pay my great tribute to all the people working for the space program. The core module is the management and control hub of the space station, with nodes that other craft can dock with. The Wintian Lab module is equipped to be a backup for the core module, able to take full control if necessary. It has the exact same functions of the core module, including the energy system, information management system, orbit control system, and so on. It's also equipped for scientific experiments. With precise extravehicular devices, the Wintian module can support scientific experiments that need to be done in zero pressure and vacuum environments. It also has emergency supplies including drinking water and sanitation items and can act as an emergency shelter. The final major component is the Meng Tian lab module. It looks like the Wintian module, but it has a different role. It's where the crew will work. Because of that, it's not equipped with a bio-regenerative life support system, a sleeping area or toilet, unlike the other two modules. Instead, it has a work cabin, a cargo airlock cabin, a payload cabin, and a resource cabin to enable experiments that cannot be done on the ground. The launch of the Muntian Lab module is a key step towards the completion of the China Space Station. It's a milestone in realizing the three-stage strategic goals in China's manned space program. The symmetry and relatively balanced mass of the T-shape makes the space station stable and easy to control. And the solar wings in the lab modules enable efficient generation of power. The Shenzhou 15 is scheduled for liftoff today at 11.08 p.m. Beijing time. The three crew members will meet up with the waiting Shenzhou 14 crew and perform the first handover at the space station. The process of building the China Space Station has required a series of technological advances. Let's now take a look at six of them. Technology for recycling and environmental control are essential for the crew's survival. The space station's life support system can remove toxic gases, treat waste and regenerate oxygen to breathe. 
the system drastically cuts the need for supply deliveries. An automatic temperature control system also ensures comfort on board and protects delicate devices. Electricity is also essential for operating the space station and for scientific experiments. The station has foldable solar panels less than 1mm thick. The panels are half the weight per unit of area than a standard solar array on Earth, but produce double the electricity. Robotic arms help with key tasks, including spacewalks and manipulating cargo craft. The space station's chief architect, Yang Hong, says they outperformed expectations in positioning accuracy and capacity for motion and load carrying. The flight control system is completely Chinese-built. The technology includes automated planning and scheduling, orbit determination and forecasts. It also makes fast docking and remote control of the robotic arms possible. Inside the station, there are applications to improve Earth-space communication and coordination. Few scientists have the chance to do lab experiments in space, and sometimes astronauts would like a bit of help. That's been made possible by remote control technology with a signal delay of two seconds, a record for China. The Chinese space program's chief engineer, Sun Jun, says tracking and data relay satellites have made effective and accurate monitoring possible. He says an emergency launch, escape and search and rescue mechanisms are in place to ensure the safety of the crew. Professor Yang, it's good to see that things are moving smoothly with the three Taikonauts now seated inside the cabin uh, waiting for a liftoff. I, I do want to talk about the three members here. They belong to China's, for two of them belong to the first generation of China's trained astronauts. Um, one belongs to the second generation, but they haven't exactly um, flown in over a decade for Fijian Lun, 17 years. For um, Deng Qiming, it's even longer, over 20 years. How do we make sure that they are fit for this job? How do we know that they are the right people for this job? Uh, well, many people from the media ask me this question if they were too old. But I should They're say in their that 50s and late the 40s. age is not a problem. You see that the oldest astronaut in history is Mr. Uh, uh, Lan. Zhang Lan go back to the space at the age of 77. Uh, so you see, also there is another thing we should consider that you know, mean uh, the first batch of astronauts and the second batch of astronauts were all selected from the Air Force, from the pilots. Actually speaking, all the all the male astronauts were selected from the fighter pilots. You can see that they are also uh, very perfect uh, candidates uh, from these pilots. So their status, their physical status, is much better than common people. Mm. So although uh, the two of them are uh, already been more than uh, 55, but it is not a big problem. And of course, you know that just before the selection of the crew, the master have an evaluation and give them scores. They must have the highest scores. Mm. So this crew must be the best crew, the best choice. Mm. The criteria being uh, not just on physical health, obviously, but also on your mental health, right? I think especially for Deng Xiaoming, who waited over 20 years for his actual first um, a flight. He was the backup for a lot of the previous flights. Some of his colleagues actually retired in 2014, give or take, if I'm not mistaken, because they couldn't wait any longer. But he has persisted. And now, here comes his opportunity. You know that uh, my friend Wang Yaping has, uh, when she becomes an astronaut, uh, a candidate, she asked Mr. Yang Li, the our space hero, uh, what is the most challenging thing for uh, astronauts. Mr. Yang Li said, study, learning. You see that to learning and the training, repeating, 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 sometimes it is boring. And usually common people cannot afford this. Yeah. So that is why we think the story of Mr. Deng Qingming is so touching. So for waiting so many years, uh, maybe 25 years is not a big problem. But repeating so many kind of things, so many training, so many learning, you, I believe that uh, common people cannot afford that. So that's Agreed. why I think so Mr. Deng Qing is a so great person. Mm. That's how people, um, as ordinary people, feel about rocket science. And their perseverance has got them this opportunity. Our best wishes for them as we continue to exactly. monitor this mission. Thank you.
And that is all we have for now. I'll be back at the top of the next hour with more special coverage on China's Shenzhou 15 manned mission to space. See you then.
Inside the cabin of the Shenzhou 15 spacecraft, three Taikonauts have moved into position, waiting for the liftoff expected to happen in just over an hour's time. Their destination, China's Owen Space Station, which is due to be completed by the end of this year. Hello everyone, you're back watching our special coverage of the Shenzhou 15 spacecraft launch. It's part of China's efforts to build its own space station by the end of this year. The three Taikonauts will head to the core module of China's space station, known as Tianhe. They will meet up with the Shenzhou 14 crew for the first crew handover on the space station. CGTN will also broadcast the Shenzhou 15 launch live on our French, Spanish, Russian and Arabic channels, as well as China Radio International. Our new media platform will also live stream this event. Make sure you stay with us. I'm Dong Shi. I have Professor Yang Yiguang of the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation in the studio. Professor, welcome to our program. And first, let's take a look back at the highlights before the three Taikonauts entered into the capsule. And for the very latest on the ground, let's check in with CGTN reporter Zheng Yibing, who is very near the Jiuquan launch site in Gansu province. Yibing, good evening to you. It seems all is going fine. The three Taikonauts have moved into position. We are about an hour from the liftoff time. What is happening right now? What is What remains to be done in this window? Well, yes, Dong Shi, good to hear you. And Professor Yang Yuguang now. This is almost one hour countdown to the launch mission of the Shenzhou 15 man spacecraft with the three Chinese Taikonauts aboard. And 10 minutes ago, the launch system has finished the pressurized process for the propellant system. This marks another big step for the ignition stage. Well, we look at the launch pad now. Uh, the revolving platforms are about to open in just a, a few minutes to come. The launch pad is the earliest and the only manned mission pad in China now is about 100 meters tall with a main structure reaching about 75 meters and circling around the 58.3 meter tall Long March 2 FKR rocket is a revolving platforms. These are the four levels. They are about to open one by one in the coming half an hour. And we heard from the command center, the top level will firstly open and then come the others. Some half an hour ahead of the ignition, they will completely open and the flight combination of the Shenzhou 15-man spaceship and the Long March 2 FKR rocket will get the final preparation. Now the Taikonauts are inside this spaceship and everything goes on well. And the people inside the launch center are gathering for that moment, not far away from me, there is a uh, there is a there's this big square. The people are beginning beginning to come to go there, and beside me there are the very big cameras. So just to throw on through this platform, we can see the very detailed footage 
of this launch process. So that's the current situation. Back to you now. Even appreciate that timely update from you. Do keep us posted there. Thank you so much. The plus is a building the China Space Station has required a series of technological advances. Let's take a look at six of them. Technology for recycling and environmental control are essential for the crew's survival. The space station's life support system can remove toxic gases, treat waste and regenerate oxygen to breathe. The system drastically cuts the need for supply deliveries. An automatic temperature control system also ensures comfort on board and protects delicate devices. Electricity is also essential for operating the space station and for scientific experiments. The station has foldable solar panels less than one millimeter thick. The panels are half the weight per unit of area than a standard solar array on Earth, but produce double the electricity. Robotic arms help with key tasks, including spacewalks and manipulating cargo craft. The space station's chief architect, Yang Hong, says they outperformed expectations in positioning accuracy and capacity for motion and load carrying. The flight control system is completely Chinese built. The technology includes automated planning and scheduling, orbit determination and forecasts. It also makes fast docking and remote control of the robotic arms possible. Inside the station, there are applications to improve Earth space communication and coordination. Few scientists have the chance to do lab experiments in space, and sometimes astronauts would like a bit of help. That's been made possible by remote control technology with a signal delay of two seconds, a record for China. The Chinese space program's chief engineer, Sun Jun, says tracking and data relay satellites have made effective and accurate monitoring possible. He says an emergency launch, escape and search and rescue mechanisms are in place to ensure the safety of the crew. We're now about one hour from the liftoff. Let's talk about everything with Professor Yang Yiguan joining me here in the studio. Professor, can you help us understand what's going to happen in this one hour window before a liftoff? A reporter talked about the gradual opening of the platforms there at the launch tower. How does that happen? Uh, just uh, before the uh, uh, this uh, before this live coverage during the last uh, live coverage, you may heard that uh, there are voice of the flight control center uh, of the uh, launch center, uh, and also at this moment we can also hear the voice. And I think the platform is now gradually opening. This, as as Yibing has mentioned, this is the top floor of the uh, the top uh, rot uh, rotational platform, and you know that to open it first means that we must uh, expose the emergency escape system and at a certain point you know that the uh, uh, the emergency escape software uh, inside the carrier rocket will be valid at this moment if anything happen wrong happened to the launch vehicle uh, we can uh, ignite the uh, emergency es escape tower and uh, separate the Shenzhou spaceship from the launch vehicle and with the parachute uh, we have a safe landing of the uh, astronauts mm. now with this top floor platform um, opening up we can now finally see that um, carrier rocket, the Long March 2F carrier rocket, exactly. that's going to carry the three um, Tyke knots into space. And what you see is the top, is the emergency escape top. Actually speaking, it is made of uh, several solid rocket engines, and some of the rocket engines will use to pull the whole Shenzhou spaceship, actually speaking, the uh, orbital module and the re-engine capital from the propulsion module and then uh, to a distance far from the launch vehicle. And some of the smaller rocket engines will be used to change its direction uh, to get it away from the, uh, the path of the launch vehicle. Mm. So uh, it is uh, specially designed uh, solid, uh, solid rocket motors. And uh, just below this will be the uh, payload fairing. The shape of this payload fairing is, uh, follows uh, what we call a common curve. 
Mm. The common with the common per payload fairing, it will have the minimum uh, drag uh, to save the entity, and also uh, the the vibration during the flight mm. uh, caused by the aerodynamic forces will be not so, so intensive. Mm. So there are multiple advantages use this uh, common curve shaped uh, payload fairing. Mm. And on the upper right corner, we can see the countdown time. Now it's uh, just over 57 minutes till liftoff. Mr. Xu Yansong is also joining me via Skype here. Mr. Xu, we were just talking about what's happening in this one hour window before liftoff. Of course, we're waiting with breath that is baited for that moment to happen, knowing how important this mission is. This is the last manned crew um, before the official completion of China's own space station, which is slated for the end of this year. Can you shed light, Mr. Xu, on what is happening in this one hour window of time? Uh, they prepared the uh, unlocking of all the systems. As you have seen that the hatches of the capsule as well as the uh, service module and the fairing has been closed. So that the opening of the top hatch means that the uh, activation uh, of the escape tower. So that is also unlocked in case of emergency. In the coming uh, minutes, 35 minutes before uh, the ignition, we will see a series of opening of the hatch and the last one will happen 15 minutes before because of the cold weather, extreme weather conditions and the uh, cold temperature. Uh, the, the rocket system, including uh, uh, some of the uh, batteries and chips, needs to be uh, maintained therm the, in thermal conditions. So they delay somehow the opening of uh, the lower ha hatch. And then there is also uh, the uh, disconnection of the ground power to the rocket power the rocket will have its own battery running just one minute before the ignition. So uh, at this time, one hour from the launch, uh, still the rocket itself and the capsule are powered by the ground power. Mr. Xu, we just saw the three Taikonauts um, seated in the capsule holding manuals um, like they're cramming uh, for the exam in the very last minute. It always cracks, cracks me up uh, when I see them holding that manuals thinking what they're doing, reading the manuals um, in this, uh, you know, uh, countdown to ignition. Can you also help us understand what they are doing in this time? Because it does seem like they're just sitting there and their colleagues on the ground are doing the final preparatory work. Is that true? Is there something that the Taikonauts themselves are busy doing? in this time? Well, you are right that they have a menu in their hand and also the uh, all the indicators of different systems uh, in the capsule. So they're looking at the indicators, uh, some of the sensors, so that they make sure that all the procedures are following to the right uh, normality. Uh, because if there is an, an abnormal in the capsule, they will have to report also to the control center. Uh, as you have correctly pointed out, that the launching itself, including the whole entering into space, oh, yeah is controlled on the ground segment. And also there is an injection of the command just 15 minutes before the launch so that the injection of the tasking uh, command would decide on the final launching time, uh, what we would call the root parameter, which is very important for the orbiting uh, insertion and the, including the rendezvous and docking. So all the maneuvers and the uh, later calculation is based on these uh, root uh, parameters. Uh, so all of these are, are happening uh, within the hour and also the menu is important to cross check with the ground uh, crew that the uh, the capsule including the rocket conditions are are, are in good in good shape so that they have they have a uh, the double check with the astronauts including the ground segment. Yeah we just see on the screen what the ground staff are up to something that they're doing in this last hour window um, they're calling it a second comprehensive checkup. Um, I assume that means, um, Professor Yang, help me out here, that, they, that they're checking up all the systems and they're monitoring everything to make sure that uh, there's no um, uh, you know, malfunction, everything's working smoothly. Uh, well, uh, as you and uh, uh, Yan Song has already discussed, you know that uh, there is a handbook uh, on, uh, in the hands of uh, Mr. Pei Jin Long. You know, that uh, this is not only there are uh, instructions of the normal procedure, but also include those of the, in, uh, those uh, something wrong in emergencies, how 
uh, they can do and what they should do. Uh, so just in these handbooks. Um, also, you know that during the whole process, as you mentioned, the comprehensive checking, the second one, uh, you know that there are multiple systems. Uh, I have mentioned the, the launch uh, site system, the rocket system, the Shenzhou spaceship system, the astronaut system, and also the TT and the C, all the uh, telemetry, telecontrol, and the communication system. And very interesting, you know, that during, although this is a launch, but the landing site system will also attend this launch. You know, that's because uh, the rescue team belongs to the landing site system. But uh, for any abnormal cases, if an emergency escape happened, so uh, probably the astronauts uh, will land on somewhere uh, along its trajectory. So this, uh, the, uh, if this happens, the rescue team will try to find them as soon as possible. Mm. So also the status of the rescue team must be confirmed by the commander of the mm. front, uh, flight control. So this is also critical, uh, all kinds of measures to ensure the safety of our astronaut. Mm. And you may heard that just uh, several minutes before uh, the uh, ground control, the commander, you will call this the uh, commander zero. Uh, commander zero, uh, sh uh, he has asked every uh, ground station to report their status. Right. So that is also a very necessary step for all these, all uh, we call this a big system uh, to check and also to uh, for this kind of if anything wrong happened he has the right to stop the whole procedure and we will keep hearing from all of those tracking units after the liftoff as well to make sure that things are going smoothly mr Shi, one more question for you can you also talk to us about how the taikonauts selected for this mission have trained for this moment i mean one of them is a veteran but he hasn't flown in 17 years time um mr Deng. Um, the other one, who was also one of the first generation astronauts, he waited over two decades for his first manned flight. Um, you know, people were saying, could they have been rusty in their skills? But Professor Yan explained to me in the last hour that they have been continuously training for today. Um, talk to us, Mr. Xu, about how they trained. Mr. Deng has been famous for a backup plan. He has been a, a backup astronaut for couple of previous missions. So we know that they have been intensively trained and also they're on the edge and ready to be uh, flown to the outer space. Mr. Fei, Fei Junlong is the uh, second uh, mission of the manned mission. Of course, you know, Shenzhou 5 is the first Yang Li Wei uh, uh, launch and land safely to, uh, to be the first astronauts and Shenzhou 6 is where Mr. Fei has been uh, uh, flown. So these are you know, a good combination of a 25-year-old, 25-year uh, uh, trainee and also a, a veteran, including also a, a newcomer that also came uh, 12 years after training. So all of this training has been very intensive and also the astronauts are separated by generations. The first group and the second group uh, they, are, uh, they are more or less independent, but they are, their training contents are same. Uh, they are they keeping uh, keep good shape uh, at all times, and also uh, Mr. Fei has been a, a managerial uh, role in some uh, in some times. Mr. Fei Junlong has been a key a key player in the selection of new astronauts. So uh, all of these are coming back to one mission. It's very important because they have already trained and back up and flown. So this is a good combination to be flying on the Shenzhou 15. A combination that demonstrates China's technological advances, as Professor Yang pointed out in the last hour, and also more confidence in um, a, a new combination, a new configuration of one veteran plus two newcomers. Mr. Xu, thank you so much for your analysis. And let's continue our discussion with Professor Yang Yiguang here in the studio. This is a very competitive business, although we've had um, generations of Chinese astronauts under uh, training, it's so difficult to make it to your actual first flight. Help us understand how the first and second generation of Chinese astronauts trained and how different are they? Are we talking about a next generation also at this point? 
you know that uh, the uh, the first January of our uh, uh, astronaut have 14 members, and uh, the team was formed in 1998. Uh, and also, they were trained in uh, some of them were trained also in Russia, uh, our uh, cooperation with Russia in Moscow. Uh, but you know that at the moment, the uh, most difficult thing is that we don't have much experience in what criteria we should choose uh, for the training and also what kind of courses they should have during their training. So just uh, uh, we, we conducted so many testing uh, to do this. And today, we've already very be practical. And even you know that, as you already asked, the, uh, when we choose the second batch, we've already conducted several flight missions. So at this moment, we are more experienced. And at this moment, we, have, we already know how to choose them and what criteria we should choose. And also, uh, for a certain mission, uh, it, it has already been uh, much better than before. So that is the difference. And moreover, you see that uh, another very important thing is we choose the second generation, including two female astronauts, Ms. Liu Yang and Ms. Wang Yaping. Mm. And you know that uh, the difference is that uh, all the male astronauts, uh, including those of, from the first batch and the second batch, were chosen from the fighter pilots. But for the uh, uh, female astronauts, uh, you know that Ms. Ms. Liu Yang and uh, Ms. Wang Yaping, they are fighter pilots. Uh, because at that moment, we don't have much uh, female fighter pilots. Uh, but still, they are well qualified and very, uh, you know, that this already been the, the Central 14 is the second mission of Ms. Liu Yang. Uh, so Ms. Liu Yang and uh, Ms. Uh, Wang Yaping are very great, outstanding astronauts, even among all these astronauts. Uh, so that's a, a great difference. But you know that in the future, as we've already discussed, uh, this time we have one veteran and uh, two newcomers, uh, this confederation. In the future, uh, according to the announcement of the uh, China Manned Space Agency, next year, probably, we will have the uh, astronauts uh, conducting the next missions uh, chosen from the third group. And you know, today we have 18 uh, members uh, during the third group. Uh, seven of them were pilots. Seven of them were flight engineers, and four of them are payload experts. So this is time, you know, that it is more different from the first and the second batch. We can recognize all the members from the first and second batch are pilots. Well, you know that at this time, the third batch, not all of them are pilots from the Air Force. Some of them are scientists and engineers, I mean, the four payload, uh, payload experts. So this time, this is because with the completion of the construction of our station, we need more professional staff to conducting the scientific research in our space station. And it is the right moment for China to choose the astronauts from the uh, scientists or the engineers. So this is uh, very quite, is quite different. And moreover, among these 18 members of the third group, there were also one female astronaut. Increasingly diverse backgrounds, obviously, exactly. which also opens up our imagination when we consider who will be sent into the China Space Station in the future. Could there even be commercial flights that just ordinary people uh, could be passengers? That's really, um, that's a possibility. But hold that thought, Professor Yang. I'll be coming back to you in Great. just a few moments time. Earlier, Fei Jinlong, Deng Qingming, and Zhang Lu talked to the press at a news conference at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. Veteran taikonaut Fei Jinlong will be the mission commander. Take a listen. On behalf of the Shenzhou 15 crew, we express our heartfelt gratitude to everyone. I was on a Shenzhou 16, 17 years ago. Now, this time, we're going to China Space Station. We're so excited and we're full of pride. For six month mission, we have more experiments and assignments lined up, including some more difficult extravehicular activities, but we're fully prepared and trained for all tasks. We're fully confident of completing our tasks, and we believe the Chinese people will leave more footprints in space. We're ready. The Shenzhou 15 is scheduled for liftoff today at 11.08 p.m. Beijing time. The three crew members will meet up with the waiting Shenzhou 14 crew and perform the first handover at the space station. Shenzhou 
，也意味着我们马上就要返回。真希望和你们一起并肩战斗，但是我们的心会和你们始终在一起。欢迎你们，欢迎欢迎。Message of welcome from the Shenzhou 14 crew that is currently on the China Space Station. Now, with the launch of the Shenzhou 15 mission, China's Tiangong Space Station will have three main modules alongside three spaceships. CJTN's Wu Lei gives us an immersive tour within China's space station, exploring some of its unique characteristics. Tens of thousands of satellites and spacecraft are now orbiting some 400 kilometers above Earth's surface. Among them is a large manned spacecraft that might catch your eye. It's the Tiangong China Space Station. The Tiangong orbits the Earth at a speed of about 7.8 kilometers per second. It takes about 90 minutes to complete one full orbit. Taconauts can even see 16 sunrises a day from the station. This brand new China National Space Laboratory mainly consists of the Tianhe Core Module, Wentian and Mengtian Lab Modules, which together form the iconic T-shaped structure. Together with the Shenzhou manned spacecraft and Tianzhou cargo ship, the whole space station weighs almost 100 tons. So how was this state-of-the-art space station put together? Let's check it out. Starting with the launch of the Tianhe core module in April 2021, China has planned 11 missions to complete the construction of the space station including three major modules, four Shenzhou spacecrafts, and four Tianzhou cargo ships. So at this size, and having floated through space for so long, how is the Tiangong maintaining power? The answer to that comes down to these two pairs of flexible solar arrays, which generate 80% of the entire space station's electricity. They have special huge driving devices, wrist-like bearing units to help rotate these two solar arrays 360 degrees to face the sunlight in unblocked positions. Each pair has a total length of around 55 meters. Space engineers say these four big solar winds generate nearly a thousand kilowatt hour of electricity per day which is equivalent to the electricity consumption of an ordinary family for nearly half a year. By the way, the thing crawling outside the Tiangong space station right now is a robotic arm. It has seven adjustable levels, just as flexible as a human's arm. Now, Tiangong can stand on the robotic arm and move around quickly. This enables them to be a lot more efficient during the installation work or maintenance tasks. All right, let's take a look inside the space station now. Coming in, you can see how bright and spacious this place is. It's a large space of 110 cubic meters with so many rooms, so don't get lost. This is the Tianhe core module, the main living space for astronauts there are three different sleeping areas where you can lie down and sleep. Actually, there are another three sleeping areas in Wentian Lab module, which will support up to six technologists on board. There are over 120 kinds of food here, so technologists will have a different menu every day. All right, dinner is over, time for exercise. We have a run machine or a bicycle. The choice is yours. Scientists developed a special recycling system to support life in space. The system can collect moisture, volatilize the water, and carbon dioxide released by the tachonauts. Even the urine is processed. All of that is done through subsystems such as electrolytic oxygen production, drinking water collection and treatment, urine treatment, and carbon dioxide and harmful gas removal. Can you imagine? Within just a year, 
The system has recycled over 2,600 kilograms of water. That's a sufficient amount of water for a person to drink over a span of two years. Now we can't forget our daily necessities: the internet, autonomous space station. Technonauts can now use a mobile app to control the lights, just like this, and inquire about the storage and supply of the materials. And if you miss your family or friends back on Earth, you can make phone calls, tap to video calls, send and receive emails. Now let's take a closer look at the lab modules. The Wenjian Lab is mainly for the scientific research of life in space, including the growth and development of different types of plants, animals, and microorganisms. For example, here is a key experimental cabinet called Universal Biological Cultivation Module, where the rice and Arabic doses are planted. In fact, Chinese taconauts and students on the ground carried out experiments in which the same seed was planted. The seeds grow under different gravity conditions, enabling them to study the mechanisms of growth. The Meng Tian is mainly for the scientific research of microgravity. In addition to the 13 cabinets inside Meng Tian, there are also 37 payload positions outside the cabinet. There is a special piece of equipment in the Meng Tian lab module for releasing microspace trucks. With the help of astronauts, the payload transfer tool, and the robotic arm, this equipment will eject small satellites weighing about 100 kilograms into orbit, just like a slingshot. So now you've seen everything from the outside to the inside. Nine international experimental projects selected from 17 countries and regions will be sent to the Tiangong later. In the future, overseas friends, astronauts, and scientists are all welcome to work and live in China's space station. The starry sky is vast and bright. Chinese and foreign scientists will join together to explore more possibilities of the vast universe on the big platform known as the Tiangong. The chief designer of the Taikonaut system of China manned space program, Huang Weifen, gave a one-on-one -on -one interview to CGTN reporter Zheng Yibing. She praised the professionals and the professionalism and dedication of the three Shenzhou 15 mission crew members. The three Shenzhou 15 crew members have gone through arduous training on the ground. They coordinated during that period and got familiar with each other. They share the same hobbies and common interests, so they can get on with one another while in orbit. I think the three Taikonauts have great professionalism and dedication to their jobs. For Commander Fei Junlong, this will be his second journey to space since his previous mission 17 years ago. He always trains hard and sets very high standards. Deng Qingming was one of the first cohorts of China's Taikonauts and has held his position for close to 25 years. Although he missed out on previous space voyages, he never gave up. The Shenzhou 15 mission is the realization of his dream, which is inspiring to many. When I heard him answering questions from journalists, I could not hold back my tears. I feel very proud of him. Zhang Lu belongs to the second cohort. It's great for him to realize his dream after 12 years of perseverance and hard work. These three Taikonauts are so inspiring and possess great professionalism and dedication. The Shenzhou 14 and 15 crews will be in orbit at the same time. What are the missions for the six Taikonauts? The handover period for the two crews is five days. Before its completion, the Shenzhou 14 crew is responsible for the duties at the space station. And then it's the turn of the Shenzhou 15 crew. The former will introduce and guide the latter, helping them to adjust to the environment. Then the former will return to the Earth and the latter will assist them during the process. Such coordination was rehearsed on the ground. And we arranged the space and ground communication via audio and video. 
The Shenzhou 14 crew also shared their experiences and offered support. This time, the Shenzhou 15 crew has prepared gifts for their departing peers. I believe they will have a great time together during the handover. Let's continue our discussions in the studio with Professor Yang Yuguang. I really enjoyed that immersive tour given by my colleague uh, Wu Lei just now, which really gives us an insider look into the functioning modules of the uh, China Space Station. This is what's going to happen, as we know. Um, the liftoff is half an hour away, and in a handful of hours, the Shenzhou 15 crew members um, will be meeting their Shenzhou 14 peers. And when that happens, there will be six people on board the China Space Station. And also, it will be a three-module and three-spaceship configuration, um, weighing close to 100 tons. And that will be quite incredible. Um, so the six of them will uh, co-work in that confined space for about five days, as we just heard from the chief designer there. Um, Will that be a rather crowded time for all of them? Or because the maximum capacity is six people, and now the six people will have to co-work and co-live for uh, five days. Mm, not very crowded. You see that uh, mm, you know that uh, uh, in the uh, in uh, initial stage of the uh, International Space Station, uh, the living quarter is located in the uh, Zvezda module made by Russia, but in this module there are only two three chambers, and there are three crew members. So if they want to be at the same moment, there is no one, there is no three chambers. Mm. But for the China's Tiangong Space Station, you know, uh, there are three uh, sleeping chambers in the, located in the Tianhe one core module. But there are also another three sleeping chambers located in the Wentian module. And also we have two toilets. So uh, it is not so crowded for the uh, six people. And you know that their daily work is based on Beijing time. And so uh, at the, uh, three, uh, the moment for sleeping, there are uh, private uh, sectors for each uh, crew members. So they are not uh, very crowded. But indeed, they will be really, really busy. As we've already discussed, there are so many works to be handed over. And also, not only those are for the scientific research, but also the operation, the normal operation of the daily, uh, daily work of the uh, space station. Mm. And now you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, this is the launch complex. Mm. And as we've already discussed, uh, the, uh, the first uh, or the top uh, rotational platform has already been opened. Mm. And then, as Yi Bing has already mentioned, the And just a quick reminder, we're now half an hour from that liftoff. Exactly. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, their meeting will be a historical moment. But actually speaking, just uh, 40 minutes. Okay, yes, T minus just, 30 minutes and yes, counting. Yes, T minus 30 minutes, we just heard from uh, ground control and command. But actually speaking, just 40 minutes later, we will have six astronauts, we will have six Chinese astronauts in orbit because the flight of the Long March 2F is about 10 minutes. Yes. 10 very exciting uh, moments. We will bring you full coverage of the ignition, liftoff, and of course, the rocket going into orbit there. So make sure you stay with us right here on CGTN. I mean, what we'll, we will also witness is the three module, three spaceship configuration, which doesn't happen very often, especially uh, when the Shenzhou 14 crew members return to Earth. I mean, this is really the largest configuration of the China Space Station. Yes. Uh but you should also notice that just before the, uh, uh, the, te uh, the technology ver verification phase, we only have the experience to combine two spacecraft together. Uh, during the uh, Tiangong-1 uh, mission with the Shenzhou-8, 9, and 10 uh, manned spacecraft, and also the Tiangong-2 uh, space laboratory with the uh, uh, Shenzhou-11 and the Tianzhou-1 cargo spacecraft. I think we're seeing more of that platform opening and yes. CGTN reporter Zheng Yibing is watching all of this for us just near the launch site. He joins me now with an update. Yibing, what do you for, have for us? We just heard from ground command and control. That is 30 minutes, not even 30 minutes until liftoff. What is happening right now? Hello, uh, Zhongshi. Well, let me update the situation here. 
Well, actually, we just heard from the command center that the the command sequence has you know, has handed handed over to the zero commander. That means uh, we have entered the final phase of the launch sequence. Now, many people have gathered in this area, some 1.5 kilometers away from the launch pad, and waiting for the moment of lift off of the Long March 2 FKR rocket with Shenzhou 15 spacecraft on top of it as a payload tonight. The temperature here at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center is really low. Now the temperature has dropped to minus 20 degrees Celsius, but the weather condition is pretty good according to the meteorologist. And the wind speed now is only three meters per second, and the temperature is about the is about that. But um, uh, half an hour after the first level of the resolving platform circling around the flat combination, it opened, and the other two. Uh, gradually opened and you know, five minutes later the last of the four levels will also open this is the same with the launch sequence of the Shenzhou 14 in June at that time I was at the live shot spot just 150 meters away from the launch pad and was ready to retreat from that area to where I'm standing now this is the first time I see manned mission launch mission at night and when I think of the three Takanas inside the capsule a few it really, really amazing because they are about to take off and head it to the China Space Station and meet the three Shenzhou 14 crew members. And it's the first time that six Taikonauts will be in the orbit at the same time and in the Tiangong Space Station at the same time for five days. It's a milestone for completing the construction of China Space Station very soon. So everybody now is excited. Everybody is waiting to see that moment. Back to you. It's incredible to think that all that meet and greet will happen in a handful of hours. We will be watching with you, CDTN's Zhong Yibin, live near the launch site in Jiuquan, Gansu Province. Thank you so much. And for more perspectives on international cooperation in space, let me bring my guest, Mani Shankar Prasad, director of the Amity Institute of Space Science and Technology under Amity University in New Delhi. Sir, thank you so much for joining us today on our special program. China's space station is expected to be completed by the end of this year. What kind of international cooperation do you expect? Mr. Prasad, do I have you with me here? Yeah, I'm here. Good, good afternoon. Good day to you. I was wondering about your perspectives on possible international cooperation um, you know, on the completed China Space Station. The completion is slated by the end of the year. Yep. What does international cooperation look like when that space station is complete, sir? Yeah. That uh, you see, the space station with China is going to put it in 2022. There is a large number of people who are international people are interested in this. Uh, you see, you must have heard that Italian Space Agency has already signed an agreement to become a member of this and do some scientific experiments. Also, United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs is actively involved in this affair of International Space Station of China. India also is interested in doing some of the experiments with the colleagues in China. So it's a large number of people are going to, you know, this part in China space station and space endeavor is that we are not only looking for developed countries, but uh, you are also giving an opportunity to, you know, developing country who can become a part of a space faring or a space race. But uh, we expect a large number of cooperation of such type of countries in the endeavor of Chinese space station. I mean, with the International Space Station, we've seen close cooperation among astronauts from um, various countries. China hasn't exactly ruled out that possibility, which means that uh, foreign astronauts could possibly join their Chinese counterparts once China's own space station is completed. 
how does international, how important is international cooperation in the advancement of technologies, in the advancement of space programs? See, India has got its own space program, but as we have cooperation goes, we have a tie up. Like if you remember on your uh, 15 experiments with China has selected containing fluid, fire, behavior, bio, and astronomy. One of the experiments being conducted is a very large experiment with the Indo-Russian together. That's a uh, nebular gas or map dust clouds. So we are going, we are going to cooperate and become a part of the International Space Association experiments as well as you know, getting into new scientific endeavor. It's not that we are going to keep it as a closed room, uh, you know, discussion. We are going to certainly become a part of Chinese space station and try and see how our manned space mission also becomes successful through this. I hope this kind of meets the answer. Mr. Prasad, we certainly appreciate your time and your analysis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Founded in 1951, the International Astronautical Federation is the world's leading space advocacy organization, comprising 468 members in 75 countries. With China's space station set to be fully completed by the end of 2022, what expectations does the IAF have for this new platform? CTTN's Wu Lei talked to the executive director of the IAF. The Shenzhou 15 manned spacecraft will be launched by a Long March 2F rocket very soon. Three more astronauts will join the three now on board China's Tiangong space station. So what's your assessment of China's manned space programs over the past decades? I need to recall even the launch of Shenzhou 5 in October 2003, where actually for the first time, China was launching its first astronaut, Mr. Uh, Yang Li Wei, uh, to space, which I think the whole world was kind of really excited about. China became the third country to be able to send humans to space after the Soviet Union and the United States. China is one of the leading uh, countries in low Earth orbit with having their own um, infrastructure, having all the systems in place to supply this platform. Um, and now, of course, with Shenzhou 15, um, bringing the number of astronauts in the space station to six, of course, is kind of giving the signal, well, it's ready. It's kind of built. It's ready to be used. It's ready to do the science on a, a full-fledged scale. And I think the whole world is actually watching after years of efforts, the China Space Station is scheduled for completion by the end of the year. What expectations does IF have for it? The expectation, of course, is that it may stay on low Earth orbit for a long time, operational, do all the science which China and the Chinese people are planning and expecting uh, to implement there. And, of course, the expectation is also that it will open up to become another international platform. We are always extremely happy to welcome our Chinese colleagues and specialists and high-level representatives to present these achievements to a global audience. We look forward to hearing again from our Chinese colleagues at our upcoming International Astronaut Congress in October next year in Baku in Azerbaijan. So the National Space Laboratory the China Space Station is open to global scientists. What opportunities do you see for other space agencies, astronauts, and engineers? The opportunities are, uh, are, of course, countless, I would say. I mean, all the range of science you can do in low Earth orbit, uh, important for uh, knowledge and improvement of the situation on Earth, but also science to prepare for going further, doing the next step, going to the moon, maybe to Mars. And we see already that um, international corporations are set up and international partners are going together, doing joint scientific projects on the China space station. 
And this makes us very confident that this will still continue and even intensify in the coming years. And we from the International Astronautic Federation, we are really excited to monitor this, uh, be part of it and provide the platform to inform a global community of these achievements. I want to talk about all of this with Professor Yang Yiguang here in the studio. Uh, Professor, before I pick your brain on international cooperation, I do want to go back a little bit to the criteria <laughs> topic that we that you mentioned just now. Obviously, we're seeing increasingly diverse backgrounds of future astronauts here in China, so they don't have to be um, pilots, fighter jet pilots. They can be engineers. They can um, come from other backgrounds. Um, but have we decided on what qualities are necessary, what criteria are must-haves for future um, astronauts? For any astronauts, whether you are a pilot or a, a fighter engineer or a, a payload expert, you must experience the liftoff and also the landing. So this is the most crucial environment the astronaut must face. So their training, including their uh, the G load or the overload training, uh, and also the uh, vibration uh, training adapt, adapt, adaptation, and also they must conduct the rescue training. Uh, you know, that's in an uh, emergency case, uh, the uh, Shenzhou spaceship can land it anywhere, maybe a desert, maybe in the lake, um, or even in the sea. So they, they must be trained to, they can survive before the reach of the rescue team. So this is a very crucial and very tough training for the astronaut, no matter what role you are. So these astronauts uh, in the future, I believe also uh, for the foreign astronauts, uh, if in the future we plan to send them into to our space station, they must also conduct these kind of trainings. Moreover, you see a certain mission will uh, be faced by certain uh, kind of trainings. For instance, if they want to conduct the uh, uh, EVA, they must be trained in the uh, the, uh, the water buoyancy pool or the underwater training. This is also really challenging for everyone. Uh, you know that uh, it is even more tough than in the real microgravity environment if, if you are in the uh, uh, neutral buoyancy pool. So that is the reason why uh, for all these uh, uh, astronauts, no matter he is a, a pilot or a payload expert, it is really challenging in, in, in among these trainings. How much time are we talking about here? How much time does it often take to groom um, a, a, a potential astronaut before he can be first a backup astronaut and then um, be selected on a real manned mission? Uh, usually, uh, they should have a course of about two years. And but for the certain missions, they will also be uh, specially trained, and the enhanced training will be conducted. Uh, and also, in uh, finally, uh, a formal crew and also a backup crew will be chosen. Uh, if anything wrong happens, for, uh, for for instance, such as T some minus fifteen minutes. minutes. Great. So at this moment, you can see that all the rotational uh, platform has already been opened. We can see the whole body of our Long March 2F. Hmm. Let's take this opportunity, Professor, and talk about that, minutes uh, countdown. that Long March 2F rocket. Obviously, it consists of different parts. We have four boosters at the bottom of the rocket, and then we have the stage one and stage two, and then the spacecraft. Quite correct. Uh, the Long March 2F is a two and a half stage rocket dedicated for uh, launch payload into the low Earth orbit. The capability, if uh, there are two versions of this Long March 2F, one for crewed missions and one for unmanned missions. For the crewed missions, the capability is more than 8.9 uh, tons. And for uh, unmanned missions, uh, the capability is more than uh, 8.6 tons. Uh, because you know that for a crewed mission, we must have an emergency escape system. The shape is different. And for this, as I mentioned, the, this uh, Long March 2F is the only human-rated launch vehicle of China which means that the reliability of this launch vehicle is much higher than a common launch vehicle. The rudiment of this launch vehicle is uh, Long March 2E. Uh, the maiden flight is in 1990. Uh, but after the, uh, the establishment of our mined space program, there are so many uh, improvements on the Long March 2E, and then finally we get this Long March 2F. At the initial stage, the reliability of this launch vehicle can reach to 0 0.97. It is already very high, but still not safe enough for our astronauts. Uh, we adapt, added a, a malfunction detection system on board this uh, Long March 2F rocket. 
uh, 0.97 is the reliability means that for every 100 launch, maybe there are three times the rocket have some dangerous things happen. But you know that this is not safe enough for the astronauts. And then we added an emergency escape system to this launch vehicle. And with the help of this emergency escape system, the safety for the astronauts can reach to 0 0.997 which means for a thousand launch, only three times, maybe the life of our astronauts will be threatened. So this is already safe enough. But mm -hmm. still, uh, for all these years, we have so many improvements on this launch vehicle, and the performance of this launch vehicle is also improve, improved. The uh, safety of this launch vehicle is also greatly improved. Mm -hmm. Moreover, you see that, you know, that the uh, launch of the Long March 2F is to send the uh, uh, Shenzhou spacecraft to dock with the uh, Tiangong space station. The basic requirement why we choose this moment to launch the uh, rocket is because that only when the launch site rotate along with the Earth, when it passes through the orbital plane of our Tiangong space station, only at this moment we can launch it. The basic requirement is that the launch vehicle must send the spacecraft into the same orbital plane of our Tiangong. So that is the reason why we choose a zero launch window. The accuracy of the liftoff moment must be less than one second. Mm. So this is the initial stage in uh, about 2011 uh, mm. during the uh, Shenzhou 8 mission, uh, we achieved this zero launch window. But in all these years, it is also continually improved because you know that we have some design margin, which means that the capability of the launch vehicle is uh, stronger than required. So with this margin, we return the zero launch window to a natural launch window, which means if there are anything error happen, we can use this capability to adjust, and then it can reach to the proper uh, position and speed. So this is also an important improvement. Understood, Professor. Thank you. I'll be back with you. The Long March 2F rocket is China's only launch vehicle for manned space missions. Compared with other rockets, Long March 2F has an additional escape tower. As Professor Yang was just explaining, it's also known as the astronaut's life tower. CDTN's Wu Lei talked with the chief designer of the escape tower engine, and he has this report. The safety of astronauts is the most important aspect of all manned missions. But what if the rocket fails during its flight period? Chinese scientists have developed an escape tower which is installed at the top of the rocket. In case of an emergency, its own engines will kick in and drag the spaceship away from danger. We are now at one of the assembly buildings at Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. This is a real escape tower now standing by for the Long March 2F Y16 rocket. It's only the main part, but the total length of this escape tower is over 8 meters. Shi Hongbin has been developing the escape tower engine system for over 20 years. He says China started to develop the escape tower back in 1992. After years of research and hundreds of ground tests, Chinese scientists conducted a comprehensive successful test launch of the escape tower and the rocket in 1998. The escape tower starts working at an altitude of 0 to 39 kilometers and between 0 to 120 seconds after the launch. It has a main escape engine, a separate engine, and four engines in a control system. So the entire escape tower has six engines. The current escape tower has been quite stable over the past 20 years, as China is developing its next generation rockets for manned lunar missions. More advanced escape towers also on the way. We are now upgrading the escape tower. The new tower will be stronger as the new spaceship is larger. So we will use a variable thrust engine to make the escape system more reliable and safe. China sent its first astronaut Yang Liwei into space in 2003. And since then, Shi Hongbin and his team have been in Jiuquan, helping guarantee the life support system of astronauts during each manned mission. It is a matter of astronauts' lives during the mission. 
It's better if they don't ever need to use our escape tower, but if they do, they will get the service of the highest standard. China's space station will be fully completed by the end of 2022 and will host more astronauts, scientists, and engineers. The escape tower will continuously play a key role in manned space missions and deep space exploration. Hulei CGTN, Zhoujuan Satellite Launch Center. We're now about eight minutes until liftoff. I'm now joined in the studio by Professor Yang Yiguang. Professor, talk to us about what's happening in those last minutes. Um, just now, we saw some minibuses pull over, so the evacuation of ground stuff obviously happened already. You may notice, uh, although the, all the plat uh, rotational platform has already been opened, but still there are some uh, uh, arms, some, uh, some arms, arms. In, in, in orange color, uh, very close to the launch vehicle. Uh, in these arms, we have cables and the pipes. Uh, so still we have, as Yen Sun has already mentioned, we have the electricity provided from the launch complex, uh, complex to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the spacecraft. And only uh, about uh, one to two minutes before the launch, before lift off, we will switch the power supply from the ground to the batteries inside. Uh, so only at this moment, we can unplug all these uh, connections. And also, you know, that our Long March 2F launch vehicle adopted a, a hyperbolic uh, propulsion system, which means that it is in uh, common temperature. Uh, 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 actually speaking, it is UDMH, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, and also uh, this as a fuel, and also uh, nitrogen tetroxide as the uh, uh, oxidizer. Uh, this is very convenient for use because it is in common temperature. Oh, we can see the uh, camera uh, inside the uh, inside the re-entry capsule. We can mm. see the three astronauts. They've yeah, been they waiting inside the cabin for um, over an hour. Yes, uh, it's already near the T minus five minutes and counting. Mm. Uh, they do seem very ready, very um, calm until uh, that happens. So, so you can see, as I've already mentioned, their uh, seats are uh, specially designed. Mm. And with this uh, shape of the seats, uh, they can afford a very great impact. Mm. And also, this will be the most uh, comfortable uh, uh, situation position uh, mm. during the liftoff and the landing. Because and after all, they're going to be there literally for hours, you know, between the waiting time and then the liftoff and the docking and the rendezvous. The, the, the waiting time is not a big, a big deal, a big deal. But you know that during the ten minutes of the liftoff and also during the landing, there will be g forces about three to four times uh, greater than our ordinary gravity. Uh, so that will be a great challenge, not very comfortable for them. And mm. also uh, during this process, there are also intensive vibration. Uh, mm. So they may, must have, you know that during the first flight of Mr. Yang Liwei, uh, the vibration is even more intensive, and he even thinks that he will lose his life. Uh, so we optimized our flight, the flight procedure, and in the uh, Shenzhou 6 mission uh, experience by Mr. Fei Jinlong, it is much more com uh, uh, comfortable. Mm. T minus five minutes. We're exactly. waiting and watching, monitoring the liftoff of the Long March 2F carrier rocket, which will send three Chinese astronauts into space. This is the last manned mission um, before the construction of China's own space station, the Tiangong. And uh, the next step will be the switching of the control uh, from the ground to the onboard computer. The onboard computer will be in charge of the whole uh, launch vehicle. Mm. Next. The nerve wracking uh, last a few minutes until we see the ignition and then the lift off of the carrier rocket. Um, we'll be monitoring the whole um, 600 seconds, I believe, the initial 10 exactly. minutes after lift off. Uh, it's about it's about 10 minutes. You see, that's, uh, during this process, Mr. Fei Jinlong is still reading the handbook. Mm. So he will be more and more uh, familiar with the, uh, the normal procedure and abnormal procedure. Mm. That's the gentleman sitting in the middle. He's yes, the commander exactly. of this mission, a veteran astronaut who um, flew his first manned flight 17 years ago, trained under China's first generation of astronauts. 
uh, with him are his crew members. Um, first manned flight for both of them. Yes, and you, you may notice that uh, just uh, between the seats of astronauts, there are also some several packages. Mm. Uh, uh, not only the packages for their mission, but also this to balance the the position of the center of the mass of mm. the re-entry capsule. Mm. It is also carefully designed. Mm. The cargo you mentioned in orange, right? That's uh, exactly it, um, in, in their return capsule. Countdown in three minutes. T minus three minutes. We have also we, we also have cameras mounted on the rotational arms to monitoring the unplugging procedure to ensure the reliability. Mm. Still at this moment we believe that we still have cables connected to the mm. long vehicle. Yeah, you can see the arms are still tightly around that carrier rocket. Exactly. When will they be retracted? And according to your colleagues, that the wind is not so very strong. So although it is in extremely low temperature, but the wind is not strong, so it is good for the launch. Mm. Wind speed obviously is, is a much bigger factor than temperature. Quite right. It is a quite serious uh, problem to mm. consider. We are literally just minutes away from the liftoff of that Long March 2F carrier rocket, which will send three Chinese astronauts into space. Um, their previous mission, the Shenzhou 14 mission, the crew members are still inside the China Space Station. They will um, be working together in the space station for a period of five days. So it will be the first crew uh, in cabin, in station, handover between two different crews. A historic moment indeed, which we will bring to you here on CGTN. There are four engines on the first stage, the four engines called YF-27. Each have a thrust more than 75 tons. And, and also there are similar engines uh, for each booster. So we have one engine. So during the liftoff, we have eight engines. They will ignite simultaneously. Hmm. One minute countdown. Yeah, T minus one minute. Really, any moment now um, before we see the ignition of that carrier rocket. And next, we will see the rotation of the arms away from the body of the rocket. Yes. Great. Unplug. The arms are moving now. They are being retracted. <laughs> to release the carrier rocket. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Three Chinese astronauts okay. in space. Pitch over. Okay, the pitch over happening uh, about 12 seconds into yeah. the flight. The tower is already clear. We can see the white flames very bright in the night. The ground station reports that the tracking is normal and the status is normal. Oh, this is the camera mounted on the launch vehicle. And we will continue to hear those tracking data um, that will tell us how the flight is going. We'll continue to hear them throughout the process. So the next critical step will be the jettisoning of the emergency executive tower about uh, two minutes after the liftoff. Mm. At this moment, we can see that this is the video uh, mounted on the, uh, on the body of the, uh, maybe the second stage. And we can see two of the boosters mm. and their flames. It's and we can see the cabin 
in, inside the React mm. capsule, and the three astronauts are in very good status. Mm. We cannot see the vibration because the camera is vibrating together with the cabin. That's right. The, the three Taikonauts do seem um, to be in a good state. And each of the boosters have a rocket engine with a thrust about 75 tons. Mm. And, and when it has reached the supersonic uh, status, uh, it will experience the, lar uh, the largest uh, aerodynamic forces called the Max of Q. Mm. Uh, so at this moment, it will be supersonic and will be safer and safer. Mm. Oh, great. The jettisoning of the emergency so escape tower. Really the escape towers really have come off. This is two minutes into the flight. Exactly. And then USB will be the separation of the four boosters. We're monitoring to see um, the four boosters coming off. I mean, you know, uh, the Taikonauts do seem to be doing fine, but this is the part where they feel a lot of discomfort, and as you can see, the so boosters are great. coming off. So you can see a cross of the four boosters. So mm. And the first stage has already been separated. And the first stage of the carrier rocket. And the second stage will work much longer than the first stage. It has one main engine. Uh, it is a vacuum version of the first stage engine. It is similar, but with a large nozzle. And also, the second stage have four vernier engines with mm. smaller thrust, but they are rotatable. We can see on the left of screen is a camera mounted on the launch vehicle. Uh, this one is a camera inside the Wait, payload I'm ferry. Mm. The Taikonauts are flipping through their manuals again. They seem to be really fine. Great. Something the, else the is The payload ferry is separated. The, that's the payload ferry. Uh, the payload ferry is what protects the spacecraft. Yes. You can see the beautiful flames of the launch vehicle. Mm. What do you make of the Taikonauts um, at this point? I mean, the fact that they're flipping through their manual seems to suggest they're doing uh, they are just very on, well. Uh, reading the parameters on the control panel and to judge uh, whether anything goes right. The ground staff uh, reports that the tracking is normal. What are we looking at now, Professor? This so is this is uh, uh, this is a video captured by the ground station. It is an optical uh, camera. Okay. So the tracking units are, some of them are from stationary units, others are from um, ships that moved into position prior to the launch of the exactly. mission. Exactly. So, so uh, along the downrange trajectory, we have multiple ground stations, including those with the uh, uh, telescopes or optical telescopes to uh, take vi videos like this. And also we have the readers. Uh, we have the readers to monitoring the... Oh, we can see on the left is the camera mounted on the rear part of the second stage. Hmm. So it is monitoring the working of the uh, rocket engines. Hmm. And the, the main engine of the second stage will um, shut down as we go further into the flight. Is that what's going to happen next? Exactly. So uh, I've already been discussed that the payload firing has already been separated. So the next critical step will be shut down of the main engine. Mm. But at this moment, uh, theoretically, it is already in orbit, but maybe not accurate enough. Mm. So, so we will use the four vernier engines, uh, the four smaller engines, okay. to okay. adjust okay. its trajectory. Okay. Got it. So another re uh, ground station reports that the status is normal. Mm. The Shuangcheng Guang Station mm. reports that it is normal. I mean, we've done this so many times, but it just doesn't get less um, nervous for all of us watching on Earth here. Yes, we just heard the voice that Qingdao has already captured the vehicle. It is already close to Qingdao. Mm. 
and the separation uh, of the, uh, uh, the spacecraft and the launch vehicle will be in the, uh, 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 to the east of the China's uh, sea coast. Mm. I mean, Qingdao is on China's east coast. The uh, Kira rocket lifted off from the northwest of China. Yes. In a few minutes' time, it moved from northwest of China to the east coast of the country. And uh, uh, before the end of the working of the rocket, the attitude will be about 200 kilometers. Hmm. Have they passed the period where they feel most discomfort now? I mean, for the uh, for the Taikonauts? Uh Exactly. You see that the most uh, uh, inconvenient part is during the flight of the first stage, mm. because you know that because of the aerodynamic forces, there are many intensive uh, vibration. Mm. But at this moment, you know that they've already in the vacuum condition. Mm. Uh, the payload fairing has already set it, uh, separated. Another ground station reports that the uh, the USB uh, and also the uh, uh, another uh, data link is normal. I wonder what they are thinking right now, um, especially for Mr. Deng, who waited uh, so long, over two decades for this time. It's finally happening, a dream come true for him. Great. Main the engine, main has engine shut down. Shutting down. It's already in orbit, but not maybe not accurate enough. So the four volume engine will adjust its trajectory mm. precisely. Mm. And we can see on the top right of the uh, screen is the uh, camera, infra uh, uh, infrared camera, mm. uh, taking the uh, videos of the vehicle. Mm. And if all things go well, we're looking at the separation of the spacecraft from the carrier rocket, which will happen any minute now. You can see that three crew members are very relaxed now. Smiles on their faces <laughs> exactly. as they have passed um, that most difficult um, period of time. A big relief, I would imagine, for all three of them. As I emphasized, actually speaking, they've already in orbit. Mm, but they're now adjusting the accuracy. Uh, the accuracy of the trajectory. Yes. So the next step will be the shutdown of the four vernier engines. As we mentioned, the main engine was shut down um, uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, you know, that's the engine uh, during the liftoff. The, the thrust is uh, 75 tons. But you know that's the second stage, although it used the same type of engine, but it is a vacuum version. And the thrust is bigger because it is vacuum condition. Changjiang 6 means uh, Yuan Wang 6 uh, space tracking ship mm. in the Pacific Ocean. So they, it is already uh, gets, the, gets the data They have link. now identified the object. Exactly. Where is this camera? This is uh, this is a camera mounted on the top of the launch vehicle uh, towards the uh, spacecraft to the front. Okay, that is the successful separation uh, of the spacecraft from the carrier rocket. You hear a round of applause from ground control because this is a critical step yes, indicating yes. initial success of the flight. And what we see now is a 3D animation uh, in the flight control center. Mm. We should emphasize that this 3D animation is driven by the real data mm. received from the telemetry data. Mm. So it's a real-time update, 3D animation, Quite indicating right. uh, the position, the velocity, the attitude of the vehicle is uh, real status. Right. And I should also emphasize, they were already in zero gravity. Is that a pen floating around in the yes, capsule? Yes, quite right. But you know, we China usually we don't have the tradition to have a zero G indicator. Mm. Usually, our astronauts use their pen to demonstrate this zero G. Mm. We're now six minutes into the flight, and the separation of the spacecraft from the carrier rocket 
has happened, indicating initial success of the flight. Let's remember this moment. Uh, just now, with the separation of the second stage, we've already we China. We've already have six astronauts in orbit. Six astronauts. Six astronauts in orbit now. They will meet and greet in just a handful of hours. We will bring you special coverage on that as well. One thing to be sure is that the Shenzhou 15 crew will be very warmly welcomed by their Shenzhou 14 colleagues. We heard the voice of the Yuan Wang 6 or the Changjiang 6, uh, the space tracking ship. Hmm. The tracking is normal. And the next step will be the unfolding of the solar panels hmm. uh, mounted on the propulsion module. Hmm. The Shenzhou spaceship adopted a three module design. On the rear part is the propulsion module, hmm. which has two solar wings. The Beijing Flight Control Center has sent the command to unfolding the panel. Tianlu means Tianlian data relay satellite. Mm. It takes, uh, it takes a, a minute between the um, sending of the, the command and then the opening of the panels. Yes. Great. The solar panel has unfolded and opened prompting another applause from nervous ground staff watching every step of the flight. I mean, this is another crucial step indicating that things have gone well. And um, would you say that the spaceship is now pretty much in orbit or is it still adjusting? It's already in uh, right orbit. The next step we will, uh, based on the telemetry data, we will measure or determine the uh, orbit and uh, evaluate each parameter mm. to, uh, to evaluate whether to judge it is accurate enough. Mm. And only when it is accurate enough can we announce that it is a successful launch. Mm. Because you know that's the purpose of this launch, uh, this spacecraft is to rendezvous and dock with the Tiangong Space Station. So the orbit must be accurate enough. Mm. Professor, remind us again how much time it will take before the docking and rendezvous happens? Uh, well, it depends on the arrangement of the plan. Uh, you know, that just uh, uh, several days before we conducted the, the, Tiangong, uh, the Tianzhou 5 mission, mm. and it only used two hours. Two hours? Yes, that, ma that makes the world record. But that was unmanned cargo spacecraft. This is different. Uh, but the technology is similar. But it can't be done in two hours. Yes, uh, mm, you know that, ma but maybe not necessary. Uh, you know that uh, you know that the six hours is already be short enough. Mm. So it depends on the arrangement. We're now, of course, waiting to hear from official announcement from Ground Command and Control to see um, whether the launch and flight so far has been a success. There will be an official announcement. We're waiting for that to happen as well. They are feeding well. The Taikonauts have just told ground control that they are feeling well, and they've been told that they can open the face windows is that what's going to happen uh mm, it depends on their uh you know that they will check every status of the uh, spacecraft and they will uh, uh, as you mentioned they will open their face window of the helmet sooner or later let's see if we can get a visual on them have they already they've already done that right great because the most dangerous path has already been passed. Wonderful. That's always good to know. The, as, I, as we've already discussed, the, the IVA space suit they, they were wearing is to protect them. Changjiang uh, Liuhao means the Yuan Wang 6 space tracking ship. Yeah, that's the flight time on your screen right now, 956 seconds into the flight. The latest critical step has been the opening of the solar panels. 
So next, the uh, Shenzhou 15 spacecraft will conduct a rendezvous, maybe several uh, orbit maneuvers uh, to meet with the uh, Tiangong Space Station. Mm. Is it possible for the Shenzhou 14 crew to watch this happen from the space station? Is it technologically possible? Uh, technically speaking, it is possible, uh, but it also depends on the plan. You know that, uh, as we've already discussed, for the, if the uh, rendezvous, uh, the inter time interval is short enough, they can see the launch. This already has happened in the International Space Station. You may uh, watch it on the social media, uh, the video taken by the astronauts on board the ISS of mm. the launch of the uh, Soyuz uh, spacecraft, all the progress. Shenzhou十五号飞船已进入近地点高度二百公里，远地点高度三百六十一点九公里，倾角四十一点三度，周期一小时三十分钟的预定轨道，飞船座舱环境正常，航天员状态良好，北京各位根数及分离点参数已向
lowest level. Mm. Uh, Foreign proposed experiments conducted by Chinese astronauts actually in exactly. the space station. Uh, so the next level will be the visit of the foreign crew. How soon could that happen, Professor? Uh, will be, uh, I believe they will happen maybe uh, within the next several years. Okay, next uh, several years, because obviously you're going to have to syndicate um, training. Exactly. You're going to have to, and also the foreign astronauts should learn Chinese. I believe they will. Um, but our astronauts speak a fair amount of English, I would suppose. Uh, during an international uh, flight mission, maybe uh, probably they will learn English. But Mr. Ye Guangfu can speak English very well. Because he trained abroad for in yeah. Italy, was it? Uh, in, in Europe for a cave diving, tr uh, cave uh, ex uh, exploration training. And uh, Miss Savannah Christopheretti with Chinese name Shasha, and also Mr. Martian Moria. Uh, was also Miss Chinese name Ma Tian was trained in uh, our uh, in, in in Yantai during the uh, uh, rescue training. You can see this is a two-dimensional uh, uh, animation mm. in the flight control center. So we can see the the red point is the Shenzhou 15 spacecraft. Mm. And what is happening at this point, Professor? Um, I mean, the ground control needs some verification of this being a, a, a complete success. What are they looking at? Um, this further you, you may notice flight. at this moment, the uh, Shenzhou 15 spacecraft, according to this two-dimensional demonstration, it is just beneath the Tianlian 104 satellite. Mm. Uh, so uh, just to be heard the voice that the, uh, the Tianlian is, uh, has just uh, set up the uh, normal data link between the satellite, the data relay satellite, and the Shenzhou 15 uh, spacecraft. Mm. So uh, all these c uh, communications will confirm the real status of the Shenzhou 15 spacecraft. Mm. And also, as we were already seen, that the, they are evaluating the accuracy of its orbital parameters. Mm. And then it is rejected that it is already accurate enough, we will, the commander of the Jiuqian Satellite Launch Center will announce the success. Mm. And we can see the big red screen. So it's an ongoing process. You need a multitude of indicators that are constantly sending you um, the signal, the message indicating success. Yeah, yeah. We measure the uh, accuracy of the orbital parameters with multiple sensors. We have the inertial uh, measurement units on board our Shenzhou 15. We also have our uh, Beidou navigation satellite uh, receiver. Uh, and also, we have the uh, other measures to measure the velocity position of our Shenzhou 15. Mm. Mr. Deng Qingming has fulfilled his 25 years of dream to go that to outer space. That is incredible. This must be an un, uh, you know, very memorable night for him and his family. I wonder if it's the same. Um, as he imagined this would be because he was the backup a lot of the times. And um, when he watched his colleagues uh, lift off and now he's experienced it himself, uh, I wonder what's just going before this through his mission, mind Mr. right Deng now. Mr. had already become a grandfather. And her daughter is our colleague. Yes, her daughter became... Um, you followed suit, followed in the footsteps of her father, yeah. um, essentially. So I, I believe next uh, the commander will announce the success of the mission. I've also been to this, uh, this hall in the flight control center. You may notice that there is a computer, there is a screen uh, in front of everybody, and you can read each of the parameter uh, from this screen. Hmm. When was that? When was that trip? When uh, was in, that? Uh, in 2019. A full room of ground control and command staff nervously watching the flight so far. Everything seems to go 
um, to have done really well. Yeah. We're waiting for some last minute um, verification yeah. before the officials um, yes. As announce their the, assessment yeah. of the, the flight. The verification of the accuracy of the orbital parameters. Mm. I mean, the accuracy, as Professor Yang explained, is everything in determining um, the success of the docking and the rendezvous because this is constantly chasing the Tiangong Space Station. And if everything is normal, next, the Shenzhou 15 spacecraft will conduct. Great, the Tianlian data rate link has already been established. And, and the, uh, it will switch to an uh, autonomous rendezvous mode. Mm. So the Shenzhou 15 it will uh, conduct the opt maneuver based Shenzhou on its own. What will the Tianlian satellite do uh, once the docking and rendezvous happens? Will it still be in use? Quite right. You know that we, are, we have the uh, communication link between the Tianlian, not only with uh, Shenzhou 15, but also with uh, uh, Tiangong Space Station. Mm. And the... Okay, the, the, the thrusters will be tested. So the uh, ground station, uh, the ground commander remind the astronauts to, to uh, keep their uh, safety belt fastened. Mm. You know, that's the, there are a lot of rocket engines on the uh, propulsion module. So they must uh, test these kind of engines. We have four main engines in the propulsion module. Each have a thrust of uh, 2,500 Newton. Mm. And we also have uh, other engines for the attitude control and also translation. They will control the attitude in uh, pitch, yaw, and row direction, and also have the translation engines to move the spacecraft to front, back, left, right, up, and down. Mm. So these are very necessary requirement to the rendezvous and the docking in mm. the space station. So uh, these engines are so critical uh, for the rendezvous and docking procedure. So uh, that is the reason why the commander will ask to test these engines and remind the astronauts uh, to fasten their seat belt. Mm. They're laser focused on those manuals again. Um, I just love it when they you know, move their legs around a little bit, indicating that they're relaxed, they're in a good state. Um, now that they've passed the most uncomfortable period into the flight. You can see on the left screen is a camera mounted on the uh, Shenzhou spacecraft. And you can see the bright curve is the horizon of the Earth. It is so beautiful. That is beautiful. And a lot of first comers um, like to snap a picture and of videos. the Earth and videos, of course. So we can expect some um, artworks, photography works yeah. from the two newcomers. You may notice uh, either the uh, camera mounted outside and the camera mounted inside the cabin, we have the very high resolution and very high quality videos. Mm. So that is uh, not easy for transmitting all these videos back to the mm. ground station. So this is a high technology. Oh, we, you, we can already see the sun. This is a sunrise in orbit. I mean, these cameras are absolutely um, important, allowing us to see a real-time um, process of the flight and what it captures really um, reassures us why we're doing this, to, you know, just to unravel the mysteries of the universe and to broaden our horizons quite literally with man's continuous exploration of the space. Exactly.
So you can see that uh, the astronauts are still reading the manual. Please proceed as the plan. The ground staff has just Shenzhou 15 copy informed Shenzhou 15 crew that the spacecraft is doing well, that the panels have opened and are doing well, and things can proceed uh, according to the plan. An automated um, rendezvous, as Professor Yang was talking about just now. And based on the information uh, uh, by the Ground Control Center, they will conduct a three-orbit rendezvous, which means that they will use about four and a half hour to close, be closer to the space station. Authorities at the Jiuquan Launch Center about to declare their assessment of the launch. Let's listen to them. Leaders, comrades, according to the flight data and report from Beijing Aerospace Control Center, Long March 2 FY15 carrier rocket has sent Shenzhou 15 manned spaceship to the preset orbit. The solar panel has unfolded successfully and is functioning well. Now I declare the launch of Shenzhou 15 manned mission a complete success. Thank you. The message we were all waiting to hear, a complete success declared of the Shenzhou um, 15 launch and initial flight. You can see the big red screen, our tradition. The big red the screen is what we always wanted to see. When the, uh, the success is confirmed. Another beautiful and successful launch of the Shenzhou 15 manned mission into space. We'll keep monitoring what happens there. China's Shenzhou 15 manned spaceflight mission um, launched Tuesday night from Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China's Gobi Desert. Our reporter Zheng Yibing spoke to an expert about the mission and has this report. Shenzhou 15.